Well, I, I'm joined today by Chris Stemple, the Managing Director of Abbey Australia, who's also on the Board of Medicines Australia, and we're going to talk about our Great Place to Work Awards. So welcome, Chris. Nice to be here, Paul. Thanks. Uh, this is something that Abbey has focused on for a number of years, and you've been there six months now. So what, what's your approach to the uh, awards this year? Well, as you say, this is something that's uh, been a bit of a legacy at, at Abbey. It's been uh, focused for, uh, I think, about eight years that we participated. Um, and, and look, I didn't get much of a chance to reshape or change the, the focus that the company had. And I guess circumstances kind of dictated a response more so than there was a clear strategic change in anything that we had done. Um, under Kirsten's leadership, you know, prior to my arrival, Abbey had focused a lot on things like uh, flexibility and gender equity and inclusion um, and really making sure everyone felt that they really belonged at the company. Um, and I think that stood us in really good stead during the COVID crisis. And um, uh, I really do think our response to that crisis is a big part of why we were so successful in the survey this year. Tell me about that response. I mean, how much of a challenger has it been for you? You've been there for six months now. And that period has been almost entirely dominated by <laughs> COVID-19. So how much of a challenge has that been for you? Look, in some ways, it was a, a real immense challenge and just kind of conceptually making the mental change that this is a different world that we're living in and we're not going to be able to continue on as we were. Uh, but in other ways, it was relatively straightforward. Abby had a pretty strong culture of flexibility and letting people work in the way that best suited them already embedded. And we were able to build on that pretty rapidly. So we were able to do things like um, provide monitors for everyone to work remotely. Um, we had all the management structures in place about how to manage remote working. We rolled out um, Zoom meetings and ways to engage with our customers really, really rapidly because we already had a lot of that core technology in place. So the transition um, to coping with the reality of working with COVID was pretty straightforward. But I guess we spent even more time talking about how to support our staff during that period. Um, one of the key things that happened was very early on in the crisis, our, our global CEO, Rick Gonzalez, said uh, in unequivocal terms that no Abbey employee worldwide will lose their position as a result of the COVID crisis. And I was able to relay that to our staff here. Um, and I think that provided a kind of base level of support that people felt like at least I have job security, whatever else is happening. Um, and then we just communicated and communicated and communicated. We were as open and transparent as we could be. And I personally was as open and transparent as I could be as you we went through that crisis. You know, we had, um, had a family member that came down with COVID and talked to the staff about that, about what it felt like to go through that, what the, the challenges that, that presented. Um, my spouse was worried about her job. Um, and that created a lot of stress and tension in our house. And I was very transparent about how that felt and helping people support through that. Um, so we did a lot to, to bring people in and to make them feel that they, we understood what they were going through and then to provide the support. It's, it's, uh, we're at an interesting point uh, as a country where we're having, we've got the situation in Victoria, uh, we have a situation uh, in New South Wales. Tell me, how, how are you thinking about a return to normality? I mean, are you even thinking about a return to normality? And what do you think that's going to look like? So we are thinking about it a lot, and I don't know that I really know what it's going to look like. One thing we've done recently is we conducted a survey about how we use our office. And one of the things that came out of that survey was there's a clear expectation amongst our staff that they will work less in the office, even in a world where they're able to work in the office as much as they wanted. Um, and that's probably a good thing, that people have learned some benefits of working remotely and they've learned some skills about how to work remotely that helps them to do it more effectively. Now, what that actually means in terms of when you have the option to work remotely and the option to work in the office and you can choose between them, I think there, there'll, there'll be some challenges that we'll have to manage. There's a risk that you create kind of two different cultures within the organization or that you have a, you know, an in crowd in the office and then an out crowd working remotely. And we don't want that, but we do want people to be able to work in the way that, that works best for them. Um, I say to the staff all the time, uh, we don't pay you to sit in a chair. We pay you to get work done. So you should sit in whichever chair is the most comfortable for you to get the work done. Um, but that's, and that's true as far as it goes, but there is a, 
an element of culture of being with other people and engaging with them is a way that we work and a way that we drive a sense of belonging. So how we engineer that um, in a world where you can work wherever you like is, is not quite clear to me yet, but we're, we're looking at it quite hard. How are you managing the, the current situation where we've got regional returns to restrictions? So obviously Victoria, parts of Sydney, I mean, how you will have employees in those in those areas living and or based to work in those areas. So how, how are you managing that? Well, we have a plan that we've been following about role, you know, opening up um, people's return to work, whether that be remotely you know, working in the field or whether that be in the office. Um, and we, every week we meet and we discuss how that's tracking and whether we need to make any adjustments to it. Um, we were on the cusp of um, being a bit more open with interstate travel and letting people do that. And we've had to put a pause on that while we wait and see how the situation in Victoria develops. Um, and I guess it just ultimately comes back to being very responsive and being very open and thorough with your communication, um, keeping an eye on things and letting people know where you come. A lot of our team members really want certainty. And unfortunately, we can't provide long-term certainty in the current environment. But all we can do is be transparent about what we know, what we are looking at, and how we're making decisions. So it, it's um, frustrating for some people, but it's uh, you know the best we can do, I think. What extent does uh, Abby's focus on things like Great Place to Work equip the organization to manage what it's currently dealing with? I think it helps an immense amount, actually. I think being um, focused on the things that Great Place to Work measures is things like, do people have uh, a sense of pride in their work? Are they, do they have enough flexibility to work in the way that best suits them? Um, do they trust their management and their peers? Um, and if you're working on all of those things, then you're likely to be able to respond to crises much better because you have a high degree of engagement and a high degree of trust. Um, and look, I think we responded very well to this crisis, but that's in large part because so much work had gone into that prior to my arrival. To, to how much time are you spending on this? And to, to what extent is, is managing the fallout and the, and the consequences, the day-to-day -day consequences and the future planning a distraction from your core business? Well, I don't think of it as a distraction. I actually think it's kind of front and center and when we think when we manage our business. So a lot of my time is spent looking at, you know, products and funding and feedback decisions and uh, engaging with uh, HCPs and, and how they might use our products. But most of that work in Abbey or in any company is done through the people that work for the company. If they are feeling confident and secure and clear in their understanding about the right way to go about doing that work, you're going to be more effective. And so I think working on your culture, uh, working on people's sense of, of belonging, working in the sense that you have a, a really great place to work, gives everyone that license to be most effective in their role. So I, I, it is a, a big focus of my time, but I don't think it's a distraction. I think it's actually one of the main ways that we deliver our results. Do you, do you, if we wind the clock forward to 12 or 24 months, can you see, changes that you've had to make in the last six months become permanent? They, they, they represent permanent changes to the way you operate? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I uh, prior to 2020, I had never been on a Zoom meeting. Uh, and I, I am quite sure that I will be on Zoom meetings permanently going forward. But I, I mean, I, I was talking to one of my senior staff yesterday who had not been in the office since March. Uh, and she was in the office for the first time. We're slowly starting to reopen. Um, and it's clear that there are some good things about being able to work remotely as consistently as we have. I mean, people's commute times are less, um, people are getting more exercise, they're able to spend more time with their families. For those of us that are going into the office, traffic is better. Um, I, we wouldn't want to lose all of that. You know, the, the balance may not be that we can't travel at all or that we can't go into the office at all, but you know, there should be a balance where we're able to get those benefits um, more consistently. While all of this has been going on, you've also been integrating another very large entity <laughs> into, into Abvi. And so that, that would have presented its own challenges, separate but not unrelated to the pandemic. How's that been going? Look, I think it's gone about as well as it could have gone, it could, given, as you say, the challenges of the pandemic. I think 
we adopted a very similar approach to the integration um, as we did to our response to the pandemic, which is about being very uh, transparent, high levels of communication. Um, and, and we talked a lot about being curious about getting to know each other um, and recognizing that, you know, although there's a lot of similarities between our two companies, there's a lot of differences as well. And we need to be curious about those differences and respectful of those differences while we're learning about each other. Um, so we've hosted a lot of different kind of online events. It just so happened that the week after the integration um, was a, we, an event in AbbVie that we call Innovation Week. Uh, and we invited all of our new Allergan team members to join us in that. And that created a lot of shared experiences, virtual experiences, but still shared experiences that people were able to have. Um, and, and look, we've had a, a lot of really good feedback that people feel very welcome, feel very supported, um, feel very much a part of something that is neither AbbVie nor Allergan, but, but something new um, that we're both kind of creating as we go forward. And so I, I'm really pleased with how it's going. I, I don't um, pretend for a second that it won't be challenges as we go forward. I'm sure that there will, um, but we, we've laid a really good foundation to, to address those. And from an industry perspective, you're obviously uh, on the board of Medicines Australia, so you've got that focus as well. I mean, do you have any observations about how the industry has responded in Australia, but also globally to the pandemic? Look, I think the industry has responded about as well as you could hope. It's, it's been really, really strong. I think um, companies have been very responsible and responsive. So they've uh, undertaken different areas of research and, and different focuses, depending on the strengths of the different companies. But everyone's um, looked at something that they can do to support it. So you know, AbbVie is not a, a vaccine-based company, so we're looking at antivirals and antibody treatments that might be effective. But others are obviously looking very hard at vaccines. There's been an immense amount of investment. And we've seen that where there's been successes in development, you know, so we look at Remsindivir, the, the pricing has been, I think, responsible and, and reasonable. Now, we want companies to be able to make a reasonable return on those investments. So it should be the case that there is some, but we also want access to be very high in their, you know, when there is positive results. And I think companies recognize that and are, and are behaving in that way. Um, I think there's a risk that, you know, funding overall for all of the industry is, comes under scrutiny as probably all government funding will come under scrutiny in, in the years ahead. Um, and we need to be, uh, aware of that and, and thinking through how we might respond to that, but, but not in a kind of overly aggressive way. I think we can do that in partnership with the, the various payers around the world. And certainly from MA's point of view, that's been our approach is to be very uh, open to dialogue as we think through the challenges that the industry might face um, and how we can support the government and the challenges the government might be facing, given this is a healthcare crisis that we're trying to overcome. Because systems do respond, don't they? I mean, I, you know, we had the post-GFC experience, and I even noticed that in New Zealand, Pharmac is proposing to get rid of sole supply contracts, uh, which is their response to all the issues they've dealt with uh, in the last six to 12 months. So presumably you as an industry and an industry leader are, are in the process of anticipating some potential responses, policy responses. Well, we've certainly spent a lot of time as a board um, thinking through some of the different challenges that, that might be coming, and I guess looking at other jurisdictions about how other governments are, are responding. Um, you know, we're not yet having to deal with any of that, I suppose, mm -hmm. but we're, we're thinking through what, what are better or worse ways that we might respond. Um, you know, look, for all of its challenges, the Australian system, it could certainly be better, but, you know, looking around the world, it could certainly be worse too. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, that's part of what we're trying to do is understand where, what, which paths might it go down and how would we, best shape it to uh, both help the industry, but also to make sure that the government is getting its goals of having a healthy population at a reasonable price. Terrific. Chris, well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, congratulations on a great place to work uh, again for Abvi, and uh, uh, look forward to chatting again soon. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Bye now.